Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, good afternoon. Uh, please settle down. We'll get started now. So welcome back from lunch. And I know it's sort of sometimes hard to be awake immediately after lunch. So we have a very uh, dynamic speaker. We picked him on purpose right after lunch. So it's a pleasure to uh, welcome Dr. Rajiv Shori, who is a principal scientist at TCS Labs uh, here in Bangalore as well as in the US. He splits his time between the two uh, labs. Rajiv has been uh, you know, in lots of places over the years. He started off his career in IISC where he got all his degrees, his PhD in 1996, is it? 1997. And then he spent time at IBM and uh, GM uh, in industry. But he was also in academia for a few years. He was the first president of the NIIT University uh, in Rajasthan. And for the past few years, he's been at TCS looking at uh, a bunch of interesting things in, around communications and IoT. And he will tell us about some of that now. OK, thanks. Thank you, Venkat. It's a pleasure to be here. At the outset, let me thank uh, my good friend, uh, I've known Venkat for a long time, Dr. Venkat Padmanabhan. But also, it's great to be uh, here because almost every second person at Microsoft is a good friend. And very kind of them to invite me for this uh, great summer school on IoT. And I think it's a great, perfect time to have this summer school. There's so much happening in the world. I've been uh, party to hundreds of meetings last few months with everybody you can think of, whether it's Cisco or Microsoft or Carnegie Mellon or Purdue, and the list goes on and on. And everyone is talking about two areas. One is IoT, other is cybersecurity. So we'll be more about cybersecurity later on. All right. So let me just give you a peek of what's to come. So this is really, uh, I thought I'm going to start with, so here is a, so just to, uh, you know, uh, before I start, I have my colleagues, Kostub Dhonge is just finished his PhD from uh, US. He's going to join us very soon, probably over the next one month, the Cincinnati labs. Uh, Dr. Jeffrey Tu is heading the labs in the US. I work with him. Uh, he's a chief scientist for TCS Worldwide and now also heading the entire program on digital manufacturing. So my talk is really focused on a very exciting new topic. I, I think very few students would probably know that, what is digital manufacturing, but it's really occupying everyone busy these days, whether it's academy or industry. So I'll have a chance to talk about that. I'm based both, as Venkat said, both in India and the US, uh, Bangalore, Delhi, as well as Detroit and Cincinnati. So here is the outline of my talk, and I'll try to do my best in the next one hour. Venkat, through a big challenge, post-lunch talks, I'll try, to be, I'll try to make sure nobody sleeps. So I'll probably ask questions to random, a random set over here. So if you sleep, then, well, you don't want to be embarrassed, right? OK, so let me start by uh, a very important area that is really uh, keeping many of us busy with sleepless nights. And that's called the industrial internet. So all of you know IoT. You know, you guys are, are, are smarter than most of us, the students. But what's new for us is industrial IoT. So there's a whole new area called the Industrial Internet of Things. And I'll give you examples, use cases, and applications of that. So I thought just to set the tone for my talk, it's important to tell you why I'm talking about this. You know, because it's very important to tell you the context of this talk, not just some results and then uh, good luck and then end the story. So let's start with what's Industrial Internet, what's the Industrial Internet Consortium. And that leads to a very important topic these days called uh, Industry 4.0. So almost everyone in this world, almost every company, including Microsoft, uh, that we work very closely with, TCS, Cisco, uh, all the OEMs that make cars, uh, Hitachi, name a company and they are in Industry 4.0, I'll tell you what that is. We'll then come straight to the problem that we have been working on. So we've been working on several problems, experiments, proof of concept, prototype, along with our students, along with our colleagues, both in India and the US. And I thought it's an important uh, moment to give you a peek at some of the work that we have done, but please keep in mind that this is a work in progress. And a lot of what I'm sharing with you today is actually happening as I'm talking. Now, is this company confidential? It's not, but it's a lot of things that I'm talking today are work in progress, along with the partners, uh, partnering companies, as well as business partners in TCS. OK, let me start with the industrial internet of things. Now, the best example I can think of is General Electric. Now, way back, just two years ago, I was amazed. Did you know this? General Electric, you know, all the air, when you fly those big air, jumbo aircrafts, trans-Pacific or trans-Atlantic flights, Almost all of them have four engine jumbo jet, the jumbo engines, and most of the engines are manufactured by the Pratt & Whitney or General Electric. Now, when you fly in an aircraft, transatlantic or Pacific, you know, you have these large four engine wide-bodied aircraft, and these engines are GE engines, 
And G is doing real-time analytics as you're flying on the Atlantic Ocean, which means that every component of the engine now has IoT. Now, you'll ask me, what those devices are? We'll come to that. That's not important. But they're IoTized, so there are all kinds of sensors, actuators, everywhere, the rotor, all kinds of uh, mechanical devices at the aircraft engine. Right from the time you take off till you land, they're doing real-time analytics. And the idea is that by the time you land, they should know whether you are ready to take off after a few hours. Because any defect in an engine in a, in a long-haul flight can be fatal. And we know that, right? We've seen many examples, whether it's Malaysian Airlines or any other example. It could be really uh, 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 devastating. So just think about it. Did we ever do us this was a fairy tale just a few years ago? That while I'm flying, somebody is doing analytics, and over the cellular link or over the satellite link is going down, and they're doing real-time predictive analytics and figuring out what's the probability that the engine will go down or some component will malfunction, and so they won't take off now. They'll give a new aircraft. So the G, in my view, if you ask me which is one pioneer of predictive analytics, and I'll talk about that, it's General Electric. Others are all, you know, great followers, but G really is doing some deep, deep work, whether it's manufacturing or aircrafts or, or name it. Yeah, thank you. Well, but remember, well, see, remember, but then now you're talking about infotainment, and uh, you're talking about the whole interface, the entertainment and the infotainment and the software piece of it. So they're really not in all that. They're talking about specifically the engine, the turbo engine that run the aircraft, specific to that. that. If something goes wrong there, then they'll raise a red flag and they'll let you know. Now, that was a very complex uh, question that you asked. Right? All right. So the whole industrial IoT is about uh, machines. It's about all kinds of machines. It could be generators in, the, in our SERC building, from my SERC building. When I was a student, it was called SERC. And the machines generate data, but the people are also a very critical element in IoT. So one of the first takeaways of this talk that I want to share with our colleagues is please don't ignore people in IoT because people, whether it's factory flow or whether it's classrooms or whether it's any environment, are playing a critical role. And a lot of us ignore people when we model the network, which is not a right thing to do. And I'll share some examples of how you can model people. And so this loop goes on and on. Machines, all kinds of machines, including cars. I'll talk about smart cars in short now. Uh, aircraft, uh, generators, turbo, dot, 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 engines, turbines, they generate data and there are people involved and so this loop goes on and on and on, all right? So the whole world of industrial Internet of Things is so important that it's defined a new consortium called the Industrial Internet Consortium. Please go to this website. Many of my friends ask me uh, within com the company and even outside, you know, give us some use cases. What are the killer use cases of IoT? Everybody is grappling with it because if I have a killer use case, I'll probably be making millions of uh, dollars, uh, right, because it's a killer use case. I think the best answer would lie in, in this website called iacconsortium.org. And you can see here is just a over peek at some of the killer use cases that they have. We, along with our partners, TCS's leading use cases uh, has, in fact, we have uh, spawned many platforms in IAC, along with Cisco, Siemens, Oracle, Tego, and Infineon. And, and I'll come to that in a short while from now. But the whole point is, if you really want some killer use cases, please go to the website. Internet Industrial Consortium is just like IEEE. It is getting all the companies of the world together and it's defining some great applications of IoT. Here is my favorite example. So go back in one year ago and we asked them, uh, so Boeing launched a platform and Boeing said, look, let me define a killer use case for IoT in the Boeing plant in Seattle, uh, right? So look at the use case. And I was amazed by what Boeing has done. So the, so the question was that when you manufacture an aircraft, you know, you have millions of rivets. Remember, when you sit near the wing of the plane, you can see that there are thousands of rivets on the wing. And each rivet, did you know, has a different pressure when you manufacture the aircraft. You know, when you open it and when you close it, you have to put different pressure. The torques are different. The PIs are different, P1, P2 to PK. Now, if you do it manually, it could lead to a nightmare because if some of the rivets are loose, it could lead to serious disasters uh, over the air. So what Boeing said is, I'm going to work with my partners, and I don't know who the partners were, please look at the website, I forgot their partners, other companies, and I'm going to now IOTize my manufacturing, which means when the worker goes and puts those rivets, I have this iPad or whatever device, will tell me exactly rivet number 1009, here is the pressure, here is the torque. Rivet number 9010, here is the pressure, here is the torque. But not just about rivets, about any small component in the aircraft. That use case has become a big hit in the Industrial Internet Consortium. And that led to almost every company, in company including Microsoft, saying, look, let's define a platform or a test bed in this consortium so that the world can use it, and we'll also learn from the experience. So here's a peek at some of the great test beds here. Don't miss this website. And here is my favorite picture, right? So now let's come to what is smart manufacturing 
and I'll quantify what smart means. What is smart supply chain? Look at a typical assembly plant. Now these are powertrains, right? Powertrains are engines. So these are what typical engines of a German manufacturer plant, right? And you know the whole assembly line is pretty complex. So any one of you who's not been to a car manufacturing plant, please go. It's a lifetime learning experience. It's amazing how a car is made. Of course, it comes out every 30 minutes, but there are hundreds of stages before a car comes out, right? From the time metal is inserted until the car comes out. It's unbelievable, like a magic, but please go to a factory and you'll see what I'm talking about. Now, just imagine if I would iotize this factory, right? And I like the word iotize the factory, which I mean, if I put IoT in a manufacturing plant or in an assembly plant, the question that we are asking in industry and academia together with them is, what are the benefits we can reap? Can you quantify the benefits in percentage? So that's the kind of questions we're asking. And I'll, I'll take you through some of those questions, right? So when I iotize a plant, I mean, maybe I'll put my Wi-Fi access points all over. I'll put IoT in the machines at critical places. I, I don't even know how many and where to put, but that's a research question. But the question, the, the key point is, once I know how many to put and where to put, what are the benefits that I can, that, uh, uh, you know, I can tap uh, from the iotization of the factory? And, and I'll give an example of what we did last year, and that to me was the first uh, such experiment of a real factory that we iotized. Before I come to that, the whole space of supply chain. Now, you know, earlier I used to think, go back in time and supply chain. That's boring. I mean, I'm a computer scientist. What is supply chain? But you know, amazing, everything you do, everything you work on, laptop, car, plane, supply chain, right? Right from the time the components that come out, whether it's uh, rivets or whether it's small components, till the final finished good comes out, the end-to-end -end supply chain is getting to be very complicated, right? Uh, in fact, now 3D printing is playing a big role, and all kinds of fancy technologies are playing a big role, social networking. But just to summarize, this end supply chain has many phases. So you source the components, you know, all kinds of nuts and bolts, and then they go into making a product, could be a car, so make means making, manufacturing a product. And finally, you end, you land up with a smart product, smart end product, could be a TV, could be a laptop. And I'm going to focus in this talk on the make part of the supply chain. Make is the manufacturing part, okay? So because the whole supply chain is very complicated, and you can iotize the whole supply chain. But that's not the objective here, it's pretty complicated. So let's look at the most important part, which is the manufacturing part uh, of the uh, supply chain. And in that manufacturing plant, so one year ago, we asked a question. We all got together along with ISC Bangalore. In fact, I don't know whether some colleagues are. So we uh, met with the friends in the EC department. They're doing some great work in Wi-Fi deployment and, uh, and IoT. So I said, look, my team said, let's, let's go to a factory where we have access to. Now, the biggest challenge is who will give you a factory because things are being manufactured, right? You don't want to disrupt operation because you take one day factory, you know how much losses are, it could be tens of thousands of dollars, right? So nobody gives you a factory and come and say, oh, I'll come and iotize my factory. It's not easy. So remember that, okay? It's easy to think, oh, I can go to any factory and iotize it. No, my friend, they won't give you the factory. There are proprietary issues, there's confidentiality, there's issue of revenue loss. We were lucky. So we have a factory in Goa, which really makes PCB boards, okay? So when you, you, when you go to the ATM, the Anand, I was just talking about you, about our Goa experience, and there you are. So welcome, Anand. So, so Anand and I and about 10 others went to the Goa factory, and we said, look, let's ask a question. Here is an assembly line, and what the assembly line does is it comes out with a PCB board. And where does the board go? It goes in the ATM machine. So whenever you take your pay money, Highly likely that board is made by the TCS factory in Goa. We exported to Germany and other places too. It's a nice small factory, uh, size of uh, probably half the SCRC building. So it's not, it's not that uh, small too. And so we said, all right, uh, Anand, you may recall too. So we said, all right, let's take all kinds of sensors with us. The, dumps, the most dumb sensors are RFID tags. So we'll take RFID readers, we'll take the Arduino boards. Of course, we have Raspberry Pis. We'll have Anand, our favorite, uh, uh, you know, our favorite sensor devices that you use in EC. Uh, right, all kinds of sensors you'll take, whether it's Berkeley Motes, and we'll, so the first question is, where do you put these IoT devices? That's not easy. Where do you put them? Where are the pain points in each stage? See, there are many stages, right? So your raw material comes, so, the, so what happens is just in a one minute peak, so an bo empty board comes in phase one, then you can see the spools over here, right? These are old machines. So each spool has a component. So one spool has inductor, one has resistor, one has capacitor, fourth is uh, connectors. So each spool has millions of components and they're turning. And when the board comes, tuck, 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 within seconds, they place the components, goes to the next uh, stage. There's inspection, goes to the oven, goes to all kinds of soldering, all, all done automatically. And finally, 
the part comes out, uh, which is the finished part, or FG is finished goods or SFG semi-finished goods. Now, there is a manual inspection over here because human beings are the best in cognition. They know what's defective just by looking at it, assuming they worked in for many years in the assembly line, right? You can't automate looking at something and figuring out what's defective. You could use cameras. That's a research work going on in many industries. But the cameras could make a mistake. They could be false positives and false negatives. So you want to, you want to rely on human beings. Not everywhere, but in many places. So the, comes the end product, which is your PCB board. So we said, all right. We will iotize this factory. We'll put RFID tags on the board. Now, it's a problem. We'll have to solder it. No problem. The board will move across stages. So what will we know from RFID readers? Well, we'll know the count. How many? At least we'll, RFID is great in counting, right? We can count all components. We can figure out if some product is not there. So if a, if a resistor is missing on the board, we can find that out. If a capacitor is missing, we can find it out. If the angle is different, we can find it out. So we can't do everything, but this was an experiment. And what this did was, they said, all right, now we have iotized this factory. We spent three days in Goa. Loved the evening on the beach, but the mornings were hard work. And by the time it was three days, we said, all right, now we have a great set of ideas, which we will take it to the Industrial Internet Consortium, which we actually did. And now we have a well-known running platform which is led by TCS, and we work closely with Cisco's and Siemens and Oracle's and Infineon's. Each of them are looking at their own components inside that end-to-end -end, uh, platform. I'll tell you what the platform is. So this work led to this famous uh, figure. I, can I show this? Probably I can. OK, well, so this figure is a figure. So here is a technical architecture of what a test bed looks like, right? So on the edge tier, you know what the edge is. Edge is where the access points are, where your IoT tags are. So all the sensors, actuators are, are in the edge. Here is a factory we were mimicking. We were actually visited. All the data from the factory will go to the edge. Cisco has its. By the way, did you know we went Cisco just a few days ago? Cisco has come out with the latest routers which sit inside a manufacturing plant. And I didn't know that. And I said, oh, really? Routers in manufacturing plants? So how are they different? So Cisco experts are telling me, well, these routers are rugged routers. They're wireless routers. They work on Wi Fi. And why industry? Because they can work across any harsh environment. So all your data that you collect in the industry or in assembly line or plant flow goes to the access point. TCS has a platform called TCUP. TCUP stands for TCS Connected Universe Platform. It's an IoT platform that we have. It's available if you want to use it. So we have all kinds of tiers, the edge tier, the platform tier, where the, uh, where the Cisco Fog Director is. Uh, and finally, you have the end enterprise tier, which has all the analytics engine, the ERP, and the cloud. Yes. No, no, you cannot physically place from each component. You can only, so that's a good, very good question. So here is your PCB board. You can't touch the components, very sensitive. You only place the RFID tag, maybe you append it at the back. So you solder it at the back of the board. You can't touch the components. How do you count how many components are going So that's the other sensors, right? So we don't only have RFID tags. So we have uh, many sensors uh, that are there, uh, Berkeley modes. We have Anand Wiss modes that we had. And I'll tell you some other research questions. We have uh, all kinds of sensors, right? So we really have a heterogeneous bunch of sensors. Each of them are doing their role. RFID is only one role. Okay. It's only per board. RFID cannot be per component. It won't be expensive. It won't be cost effective. Just to share with you, even the question of how many tags, how many tags and where is, not, is an open question. It's not obvious. So apparently, uh, Anand would know best. EC has come out with a great tool. ISC has come out with a great tool, which if you feed in the parameter, will tell you where to place the sensors, at what distance, because it's all about radio propagation, right? And how many? What's the critical minimum number of sensors? Because that's not obvious, right? You don't want to spend, blow your money putting 100 tags, and you don't want to put five tags, because that won't give you any results. So, so just to summarize part one of the talk, that you have all kinds of platforms that are coming out. Remember, it's your, the focus of this workshop is only here, the last mile, IoT. But look at the end-to-end -end picture. There's deep analytics, there is cloud, there is aggregator, there are platforms. So just to excite the audience that when we talk about an end-to-end -end picture, it's everything, not just the tags. That's the last mile, all right? Cell phones just start from your cell phone, but look at the back end. It's huge, right? Base station, base station controller, MSC, and the list goes on and on. So that's the whole story over here. OK, so that's really the summary of uh, the excitement that is going on in industry, in uh, industrial internet. So what is industrial internet of things? When you want to leverage IoT in an industrial manufacturing setting, then that's the whole uh, space of industrial Internet of Things. And that has led to a very interesting concept called Industry 
So Germany, as you know, is one of the world leaders in manufacturing, and I don't know why, but they really are the, the best in the world in uh, manufacturing anything, whether it's cars or other components. And Germany came out with a new term called Industry 4.0, and here are the enablers. Now, therefore, the new word for manufacturing is, is called digital manufacturing. And I think the answer is obvious, that anything that we do in our own area in computer science, whether it's mobile pervasive computing, right? It's sitting in a factory floor. And I'll give you some examples. Cloud, well, backend has to be a cloud. Where will all the data go? You can't put it in the fog. You, can't, you certainly can't put it in the IoT. So you've got to put the data in the cloud, uh, private or public. You need to leverage social media. I'll come to that. You need big data analytics. Every time you are gathering data, you need to do semi real-time analytics, if not real-time. Okay? And finally, AI and robotics are playing a huge role. Almost every company is asking a question, how can I leverage cognition to make my system smarter? So one of the things I want to uh, share with our friends today is that IoT world is, we all know it, right? Physically, IoT is a dumb world. If you can add intelligence on the higher layers, the higher layers are edges. It could be access points. I was just talking to a friend this morning, and he said, I put intelligence at the edge, which will try to do some wonderful uh, shaping and, and all kinds of things uh, to your traffic to make it all kind of intelligence on the edge. So if you could throw some intelligence and define those algorithms at the edge or at the fog or even at the IoT devices to some extent, that's the novelty of the space that we're talking about. That's the killer. Uh, one of the killer areas that everybody is focusing on. Not easy, but that's the whole idea. So Industry 4.0 is all about leveraging everything we are doing in our area, in computer science and EE, and seeing how can you make the performance of industry better, which means better products, higher quality products, higher throughput, and everything better. And therefore, you make more money, and you have less losses. So you lose, uh, uh, you want to minimize your losses, you want to maximize your profits. And indeed, it is turning out now that if you leverage these technologies, and many more, I, I, this is not exhaustive, you will definitely come out with smarter and better products. And that's why it's called smart manufacturing. Okay? So smart manufacturing is a superposition of all these technologies. And uh, many companies are now trying to see uh, how do you explore, exploit all these technologies in the manufacturing context. All right. So with that, let me come to uh, some interesting experimental results. And as I said, this is a work in progress. And there are many experiments that we've done. But I thought I'd share with you one of the experiments. So let's look at the industrial internet of things, and let's see some results from some early experiments. All right, so here was a question that we asked. So what we asked was, look, what is IoT? So you want to put, so we're talking about manufacturing, right? So I'll deploy IoT all over my factory floor. Let's say I'm making a car, I'll put IoT everywhere, uh, wherever I can, right? At each stage of the manufacturing process. But the problem is that if IoT does all the computation and communication, I'm going to kill the poor fellow. It is highly resource constrained. These small devices, right? Uh, and I'll show, yeah, I'll come to this. All these small devices, whatever they may be, they could be your WIS modes that our ISC works on. They could be Berkeley modes. Uh, they could be in tags. They hardly have any resource. The, the processing power and memory is very limited. So you really want to outsource. You want to offload as much as possible. But you can't offload to your neighbors because you're you killing your neighbors. So you really want to offload it to a higher layer, which presumably has more intelligence, because that layer has more resources. So what's the premise of this story? That we are trying to understand, uh, we're trying to iotize a smart manufacturing plant. Uh, and we are trying to understand how can we make it a, safe, a safer, a more efficient, and a more optimized plant through IoT. And if I can give you some percentage numbers that convince you that it indeed does better than I've done my job, hopefully it'll excite the audience to take it further in a real setting. Okay? Now, there are all kinds of sensors. So one of the questions we grapple with is, in our environment that we work in now, there are all kinds of multimodal sensors. So there are vibration sensors. There's, of course, RFID, the dumb RFID, right, that, which does counting. There's temperature. There's humidity. There's hazardous gases monitoring pressure. And the list goes on and on and on. It's a, now, is there one sensor that gives you all? No, it does not. You really got to buy all, fit them in an Arduino board. I'll show you the figures. I'll show you the experiments. So it's a lot of work by our software engineers, but they're really smart these days, so they can get away with all that. Uh, they can you know, resolve all this. But the whole point is that you, don't, you can't do with one sensor. You really need a plethora of multimodal sensors to be able to answer fundamental questions that we are talking about. Okay? So the problem is that, so it's clear that if you want to really understand the factory and take it to the higher um, order, you really need to iotize that. So here is an example. right? So, so let's define a vanilla architecture. Now, what's vanilla? 
vanilla means that here are these dumb iot devices they are placed wherever you want to place them in a floor let's say the floor is an assembly plant which makes the pcb boards doesn't matter so you figured out where to place them this is stage 1 stage 2 stage two, wherever you place them in some nice uh, topology uh, right and so these are all iot devices now look at this figure and and all the iot devices eventually talk to your raspberry pi one or two doesn't matter how many but they eventually talk to the uh, lightweight base station which is the raspberry pi so how does it go so now look at what happens i'm sensing the machine i'm sensing all kind of parameters i shared with you in the last slide and look what's happening and so they're all sending data to from the rightmost uh, rightmost to the leftmost uh, column and it's finally going to the base station and eventually of course will go to the cloud because you can't do analytics uh, that deep analytics can only be done at the cloud right so eventually what's happening but see the problem with this solution uh, interestingly when i was talking to some phd students in isc uh, it it was interesting but what serendipity turned out that some of the students working in the, uh, some of them working in their research uh, phd problems there was some overlap with what we had done last year so they are now beginning to think of these problems which i thought was very exciting so a lot of us are thinking alike so look at the challenge in this figure right so uh, let me just finish the picture and then uh, talk about it so look at the rightmost side so the rightmost side has a few sensors it's sensing vibration temperature humidity dot 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 there's low congestion here and there's low energy consumption energy i mean power so we really measuring the power so we actually do power measurements i'll show you the next few slides and as the data goes on the left side you find that the network is getting more and more congested and these devices are expending more energy they, right because they have more data coming through so they are they are chugging out more data and so the net energy consumption per device as you move from right to left is increasing yeah just go ahead. Oh, no, 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 everything right now is battery powered, everything, because so that's the whole idea. You don't want wired devices. You don't want wired devices. So, for example, let's take an energy meter. You just want to, you want to find the right place where you can just attach it to a, to a machine component. You don't want wired devices, ideally. Right now they are, but the whole idea is you want completely pervasive environment, okay? Because, you know, you want to move it around and uh, even though scenario doesn't change much. So observe that as you go from right to left, you are having more and more congestion, a traffic congestion, and therefore it's resulting to more power consumption. And so in some sense, that's not the best thing. Uh, so the IoT systems in this context really suffer from high and uneven energy consumption. So what's the first takeaway? On the left side, you know, so the, there's a complete uneven distribution of uh, e energy and the traffic load, okay? And, and that's not surprising at all. It's fairly intuitive also. All right. So the IoT systems tend to suffer from high congestion at the end nodes. The end nodes are the last mile, the right side. And, uh, and that's because of the topology. And so it becomes a nightmare. It, there's no ba load balancing. You don't want that. It can lead to serious problems. And so it can result in a non-satisfaction of services of agreements and overall high energy consumption that can result in increased carbon footprint. If there are hundreds of devices, you don't want to throw away the resources, all right? So what's the solution? Well. So we want to improve the reliability of these networks, and we really want to reduce the overall energy consumption. Now, that's one metric. Energy, not the only metric, but I'm focusing on energy right now. You could talk about improving throughput or minimizing the latencies, which we will talk about. But right now, I'm just focusing on minimizing the power slash energy consumption, power energy related, right? It's a trivial relationship. So, and so two things we want to do. We want to minimize, we want to minimize the total energy consumption, sigma of EI, sigma across all the devices, you want to minimize it, number one. Number two, you want to load balance it. You don't want an uneven distribution of, an, uh, of traffic because that doesn't serve your purpose, right? Because what will happen is then some node will fail very quickly and you're going to replace them and you're running helter scale. You don't want that to happen. Yes? So I, right, so you, you read my next, uh, you kind of conceived my next few slides. That's right, so I'm coming to that. Partly your answer lies in the next few slides, but uh, partly as I said. So what's the solution? So one of the solutions we propose is HOLA, which is really, so HOLA stands for heuristics, so it's plural. Several heuristics and opportunistically selecting links at devices, and I'll, I'll explain that in just a few seconds from now. Okay, so let me skip through all that. Let me come straight to the picture, because the picture conveys much more than all these, uh, uh, this stupid text, right? So here is a, so what we did was, we said, all right, 
Now we know that if you go to a plant floor, you go to any manufacturing setting, right? What does the scenario look like? Every worker has a wearable, right? So today when you go to a GM plant, and I'm talking through experience, it's not just a randomly cooked uh, uh, use, use case. Every worker is carrying a smartphone. And when I use the word smartphone, I include wearables. So he, has, he or she has an iPad or a Samsung uh, notepad or specific devices that are given to GM workers as they sit in an assembly plant. And by the way, so the tablets are pretty fancy. Every tablet tells you exactly what's happening in the plant. Oh, the temperature is high there. Oh, there's a problem with this stage. Because if they don't know that, then it can lead to serious production problems. And if one stage uh, goes down, then you're, you can have millions of dollars of losses. You know, one hour of shutdown of a GM plant can lead to, uh, can lead to a havoc in your uh, revenues. So you can't afford that. So every worker has smart devices. They are not just smartphones. They're all kinds of devices. So that's the assumption. Now, that's the higher layer. Now, convince yourself that the smart devices obviously are higher layer to the IoT devices. And so these devices have much more uh, bandwidth. They have multimodal interfaces. So they have Wi-Fi. They have Bluetooth. They have uh, cellular, LTE, name it. Uh, they have uh, all kinds of NFE, uh, NFCs. And so this is the higher layer. And then now they're talking to the IoT devices, the dumb IoT devices at the lower layer. Now, if only we could do that, if we could do this, think about this. If we could now, now you know the problem with the, with the legacy figure, right? With the vanilla architecture. If you could do this, hypothetically, if you could define a cluster, right? So I, now, don't ask me how to define a cluster. That's a research problem, right? So we did define, but the work is, uh, goes on. It's a work in progress. So if you could define a cluster and, and then choose the best smart device near the cluster. Choose the best. I'm not saying choose the nearest. Choose the best. And I'll define what the best is. Then that's a nice candidate to serve as an access point for this cluster. Similarly, you define this cluster and you define that cluster. And you choose the best smart devices which are running on top of the IoT devices. And now if you try to offload as much data as possible to the cluster head, which is really the smarter devices, because they have more resources, energy, uh, they have much more uh, memory and uh, power. Then you, and, and then in turn, what these devices will do is that, so we call them cloudlets of IOTs. Finally, these cluster heads or smarter device will then send the data opportunistically to the cloud. Uh, what do I mean by opportunistically? Well, there are many interfaces. So at any point of time, you are measuring the, the energy expended on each interface. Okay, so, and then you choose the best interface. Okay, what's the best interface? Well, it is a function of the service level agreement. What is the upper bound on delay? What's the packet loss probability? So you really define SLAs, and that's how you choose the best interface. Not from here, from the smart devices. And then you throw out the data from the best interface to the backend, whatever the backend is. So what's the summary of the slide? The summary is that you create cloudlets of these sensor nodes. You opportunistically offload sensor data to the higher layers. And with that in mind, hopefully you will conserve energy. Now, will you? I don't know. Let's, let's see. Let's see what we did. So here were some experiments. So the summary of the slide is that HOLA, which is the, which is the heuristic, reduces the total energy consumption, the sigma EI, and also distributes the energy evenly across the diverse IoT devices. Let's take an example of, uh, and there are many related work over here. Uh, the work, you know, the literature has different uh, stuff. It, it, you know, it basically has sleep-awake cycles. It has uh, tweaking with the MAC layer. Literature does not really talk, ab talk about ex uh, exploiting uh, diversity across different layers, throwing data across different layers to minimize your energy consumption, right? Not that we know of. All right, so let's go straight to our, some of the percentage improvement that we see. But before I do that, I like to remind you that this is an experimental study. Of course, backed by simulations, because you can't study scalability with the actual experiment. You've got to simulate it. But you first have to do an experiment. If you don't do experiments, then the, the values you'll plug in in your simulator are going to be junk, because you'll be questioned how you got those values. And there's no way you can validate the data, the values of the uh, parameters and what their, uh, uh, what their exact value is, right? So what we said was, all right, we'll go to the, we leverage the famous Arduino boards, Arduino Uno boards. So we'll have Arduino boards uh, placed all over the factory floor. These are very good, good boards because, uh, and I'll show you why. So uh, Arduino boards are run by the Atmel Atmega processor, which is pretty robust. It's a well-known processor. Uh, the sensor that we work on are the Bluetooth uh, communication. The communication module is Bluetooth. The sensors are RFID, vibration sensors, temperature, and humidity sensors. So we really are working with several sensors. Here is a nice picture. So here is what Kostov did in, uh, uh, in his experiment. 
So he said, all right, I'm going to build everything from scratch. So here's my Arduino device, and, and look at the number of sensors. The list goes on and on. This is not exhaustive. Because as we are talking, he's trying to add more sensors, and we're figuring out what sensors do we add. Let's look at some other uh, important sensors. So right, right from temperature sensors to vibration to Bluetooth to RFID, this is the RFID reader. And you can see that here is an Arduino board. Which, you know, look, this is the size, it's really the size of this, a uh, little bit bigger than this, size of a cell phone. Okay? It's big, but you, know, you really can't, at this stage, you can't uh, further compact it. So here is what your whole device prototype implementation looks like. And when you have a large number of these, you are now ready to play games in an actual setting. Okay? So it's a plug and play device. You can remove some sensors if you don't want them. You can add if you want them. So not a problem at all. And uh, now let's look at a skip that. Now let's look at, yeah. So, so what we did was every time we were transmitting a packet or receiving a packet from the Arduino boards. So we started with one sensor, right? Keep just one sensor, measure, do all the measurements. The next slide will, have, uh, will show you the measurements. Then you add the second sensor, you repeat the measurement, and then the list goes on and on and on. Finally, you have this whole complex ecosystem, and you take the measurements, and this then leads to some interesting uh, observations, right? So, so think, look at this. So when you have nothing in Arduino, it's idle, you are consuming that much uh, milliwatt of power, whatever the number is. It doesn't matter what the number is. The, whole, the concept is important, not the actual numbers. When you have one sensor active, which is a vibration sensor, you are consuming more, and it's a monotone increasing, which turns out to be that as you add two sensors, obviously you will consume more power. But, the, uh, but this is interesting. The moment you enable Bluetooth transceiver, look at the energy that you're expending. It's significantly higher when Bluetooth was not there. Because Bluetooth uh, has so many phases. There's a discovery phase. There's a communication phase, right? You're discovering the device. And you, all, all, uh, you have all kinds of power, measure, uh, power phases there. And finally, yeah, and discovery phase, it turns out, takes really a significant amount of power. So, so these are measurements done using the Arduino boards across diverse settings, and they led to these values. And these values were repeated many times. It's not just the experiment was done once. I think he repeated them for months and months, till finally he convinced himself these were the right values. And it turns out the radio frequency emitters and receivers do use significant amount of energy. So when you, and you know this, because when you switch on your Wi-Fi and your cell phone, or the, the rate of drain is, is really rapid. It'll kill your battery. So it's not surprising at all, right? So here is a first figure that tells you that as I increase the number of sensors, now this, is this, this figure is obvious, right? As I increase the number of sensors, my power con consumption goes up. But interestingly, it goes up significantly when you have Bluetooth or, or, or Wi-Fi uh, enabled, right? Uh, in comparison, comparison to when Bluetooth is not there. Okay, so now what we do is we, all the, all the values we get from that experiment that we did, we now have a simulator, uh, NS2, whatever, NS3, and in that simulator, we then, uh, you know, we then put 700 devices in a factory floor setting, whatever that grid is. I don't think it's a, it's a very, very nice streamlined grid. It's, it, it's a grid which uh, we came out from a factory floor. And so you define that grid, you define all the parameters of the factory, you have a, obviously a channel model, you need a wireless channel model. And so assuming that we have a fixed wireless channel model with all the parameters of the Markov chain, uh, two-state Markov chain, you now compare the HOLA system. HOLA, HOLA is our uh, system where you are leveraging the smart devices or the wearables, and you compare it with the vanilla system, the dumb system which only, where only IoT devices measure and send it to the backend. And the first set of results, as time goes by, and if you look at the power consumption on the y-axis, the vanilla, vanilla is the blue one. The vanilla power expended is, is strictly more than the HOLA. Okay, now, now here's the catch. We are not measuring the power of the smartphones. We are not. So the results here exclude the energy of the smartphones. Why? Well, the assumption is that the real resource constraint devices are the IoT devices, not the smartphones. Now, of course, that experiment has to be done with smartphones added. But the logic is, as you go up the layers, there's more and more intelligence. So do we really need to measure? For example, do you want, are you worried about the power consumption of your Wi-Fi access point? I'm not worried about the Wi-Fi access point. I'm worried about the laptops or my cell phones or the smartphones. Pardon me? They d okay, good question. So very good point. So there is mobility, but the mobility, no, we do capture mobility. So there's a mobility model, but the mobility in the, in the, in the environment I'm talking about is very constrained mobility. Nobody is running in a factory floor. So they're walking around, they're checking the health of the machines, they're looking around and they're adding parameters and they're checking it. So they're walking. So it's a walking speed. So even when you walk with your wearables or smart device, performance uh, degradation is not observable. But you start running around a factory, all this will go. 
it'll really go haywire. Okay. But then you have to have a better mobility model. Yeah. Yeah. It's dynamic. So you, yeah. so you can have many smartphones on the higher layer. And now the question is, which one should I choose? So you use some heuristics to choose the best one. The link quality. So you choose a, a link which is the most robust link, and you choose that. Now that can change dynamically, as you rightly said. So the mobile move, that can change, sure. So obviously, when you start the experiments, you're assuming static devices, and then you inject a little bit of mobility. Little bit of mobility. Yes, please. Uh, the cluster, you cluster had uh, quite a few devices. This cluster, right? So let me go back to that. Yeah. The cluster uh, had, I say, 10 devices. Right. Right. They directly transmit to the best smartphone at that point in time. Yeah. No, no, we did not. We did not. So now you are talking about the nuance of the Mac layer. No, we did not. So by the way, the Mac is a well-known CSM is CM Mac. No, we didn't tweak with the Mac at this point in time. There is a work that we are now, we are asking ourselves that if we now there's been some uh, reason to believe that if you change the CSM is CM Mac to TDMA Mac you'll do better. But I'm worried about TDMA Mac because how do you synchronize the entire system? And these are large number of devices. So my worry is that you'll, you'll have a lot of energy overhead and just trying to synchronize the device. Even though it's a PAN, personal area network. But still, you've got to synchronize the device. All the modes were on. Good question, all the modes were on. As I said, it's an experiment one, phase one. Absolutely. So permutation combination is not what we looked at. Uh, where? Amongst these devices? Amongst these? Yeah. Yeah, you are, but then the Mac is, I mean, the, that's the Mac question, right? The media access control will take care of that. So what does Mac tell you? Mac says, okay, who will talk at what point in time? So that's not our headache. But yeah, so to answer his point, we assume all are active, because now if we inject sleep, uh, you know, the cycles over here, sleep awake cycles, that is itself going to take, expend some more work. So we said, look, let's just put everything in our ab initio simple mode and now try to answer some questions. So see, the thing is, we are first trying to answer how can you leverage benefits by, by offloading data to higher layer. Now, there could be another layer. By the way, there's another layer over here. I've not shown that. That layer is a layer of smart access points. I've not shown that because I don't need to show that. That's a very strong layer. Yeah. Except that there's, uh, but there you're moving around, right? Yeah, but there is a mapping with data mules. Yeah, but keep in mind, yeah, Shima, that's right. But remember that we are also trying to figure out which is the best interface uh, at each of this device. We are also figuring out what's the best way to define a cloudlet. Because if you want energy as a metric, you want to make sure that whatever you do yields minimum energy expense, uh, right? Energy expended is the minimum. But that's right. I mean, except that, except the one difference is the scale is much more over here. So if you have n devices over here, you probably have root n smart devices at the higher layer. Root n is just a random function, but of that order of root n, right? Okay. So so let's look at. So it's clear. It's intuitively clear that. Yeah. Pardon me. Oh, so you have all kinds of measurement tools. So you actually, you actually uh, are, so all these boards are on, all these sensors are on. You're actually measuring uh, the power expended when you transmit or receive the packet. Now, that's the, that work has been going on for a long time, even in the Wi-Fi community, or the Bluetooth community. Can you tell me whatever equipment you You just uh, use, you tap your standard uh, power meters. There are all kinds of power meters over there. So you kind of tap those power meters, and you actually measure. So I repeat, we are not. We are measuring, we're taking one Arduino board, and we're measuring power across all the sensors and actuators, one after another, and seeing the changes there. So you're really starting from scratch with nothing there, uh, with only an RFID reader. I don't remember that. I can share it with you. I can share that with you. I can send you the paper. Too. Yeah. I, I'll dig it out now, after the talk. Yeah. No, 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 no. It's only the power. The total power consumed in sending the data from the IoT devices to the to opportunity to the nearest uh, smart device. 
nothing to do with the smart device. This does not include a smart device. It, can be also of offloading. it is offloading. Absolutely. It is that. It's exactly that. Well, let's look at this figure. So this is interesting. So some of the questions will be answered now because you know I let me just come to the point. So look at the vanilla figure. Uh, so look at the figure carefully, right? So don't worry about evolution of time. This tells you about you know just the you know convergence. No matter what time you are at, let's look at after certain time that we are measuring. The distribution of power is very skewed, right? So if you remember that the extreme right had a you know you are starting to measure the you're starting to measure uh, extreme right and then it's sending data in the in the legacy system in the vanilla system. Vanilla means there's no smart devices, right? And then the entire data goes on to the uh, access point to the Raspberry Pi. Not surprising that your power distribution is very skewed. So the highest power consumed is devices that are close to the Raspberry Pi, and the lowest power expended is devices that are furthest apart from the Raspberry Pi. Not surprising at all. We know this from the networking world right from the time we started network, right? Ad hoc networks, because you're, you're accumulating data towards the Raspberry Pi. It's going only in one direction, right? So this is not a good thing to do because what will happen is the consequences are this will die very quickly. You don't want a uneven, uh, you know, a random distribution or a, or a unbalanced distribution. And now look at this figure. Just look at this figure carefully. Now I don't want to look at these, but trust us, and I'll be happy to send you a paper or set of papers that these values are significantly lower. Now this is the HOLA power consumption. HOLA is the proposed when you are leveraging the smart devices. When you are offloading data from the IoT devices to the smart devices, this is the sum of the energy across all the IoT devices. Look at what you see. You see that the first observation, fairly nice distribution of power, right? Distribution of energy, fairly nice. It's not completely uh, even. It cannot be, but it's much better than the previous, uh, in a, a, a previous crazy figure. The number two observation is that the power level, the sigma EI, is strictly lower. Uh, which you can't see from here, but you can gather from over here. So if you if you map this figure, right, then you'll uh, will be able to convince yourself that uh, when you leverage the smarter devices that include variables, and there are all kinds of variables in the market now, you will uh, do much better in terms of total energy expended by the IoT system. Okay, so that's the key takeaway of leveraging smarter devices in an IoT world. So the model of the stories, just one second. So the model of the stories. Do not use, do not end your work, or do not just focus only on the IoT layer, which I call it the lowest physical layer, because it may not give you, uh, it may not yield much dividends, because it's a highly resource constrained layer. And what if, God forbid, a few IoT devices uh, conk off, you know, they just uh, die out, now you are in further trouble. Yeah? No, not really. Well, what's happening, it's stabilizing with time, because, oh, well. Initial transients uh, die out with time. That's why you saw the gap also is increasing a little bit with time. No, that's just because when you start measuring, uh, you know, with time. That's why we had we had this extended period of time. See, when you measure uh, over an extended period of time, you are able to uh, get much better, but much better averages. And so there's a there's you're just moving the transient, right? And the transients could be because of many reasons. So just showing that at the end of the day, the difference is not that much, but at the end of the day you are stabilizing uh, at a very nice even distribution and, the, and if you compare this figure or any figure with the vanilla figure the power is strictly lower it's a strict inequality all right so what are we doing now well so now the work that we are extending is well let's look at some uh, some more relevant indo propagation models let's uh, introduce so one of the things that we are uh, grappling with is how iot in an environment that i'm talking about is a harsh environment and so modeling of your RF radio frequency is a challenge. What do you mean by that? The channel model is not your standard Hakagami channel or all the kind of uh, channel. You've got to figure out what the right channel model is, number one. Number two, you have a lot of metallic surfaces. There's huge attenuation. There's water, there's all kind of chemicals, there's all kind of metallic surfaces. We need to understand the performance of IoT devices in this new environment which the world has woken up to in the last few years. So please don't just take a paper from transactional wireless networks and just map it to your environment over here because it may not work. You've got to figure out what that channel model. And Anand, if you remember that, and I'm going to share something what we did. When we went to the Goa factory, Anand and his team, you actually, they, we deployed the sensors and we saw that, you know, it, it's a horrible deployment because the attenuation is terrible. So even the right place where you put your sensor, and then we use, the, you, we, we use your simulator to figure out uh, which is the right placement and how many IoT nodes. So even the question about how many and where is not a trivial question. 
the research question in the environment that I'm talking about. Okay, we are available after the talk to talk to you at length about our experiments that we did along with ISC Bangalore. Okay, and finally, let's mimic a factory environment as much as possible. And what better than to go to a factory? So my current endeavor is to please, uh, to go to a Tata Motors plant or a plant near Bangalore, a Titan plant, and to actually, and this is work in progress, I'm talking to our colleagues and asking them, look, give us a day where we will go with ISC Bangalore and colleagues and we'll actually try to model a plant and put it in a simulator. So there's a lot of work going on in digital twin because you can't, you can't uh, go to real factories in your life beyond the point, you know, nobody will allow, allow you. But can you go and capture the nuances in a digital twin, which is a simulator? And if the simulation is correct, I tell you, you can come out with 10 transaction papers, some num uh, a plethora of good papers, because the model has to be right. So what are we doing now? So I'm going to wind up my talk in the, this uh, probably will take 10 more minutes, because we started about seven minutes late. So is it okay if I wind up at 3.10, Venkat? So here is what we're doing now, something very interesting. Now let's move on to something more exciting. So we are, see, we don't have access to a factory. Can we uh, make happy with our home? So we said, all right. In US, every home has a washer, dryer, complex refrigerators, fancy dishwashers, and the list goes on and on and on. So let's put these Arduino boards, and here is a figure. I'll come back to the figure. So there are many, by the way. There are many. I've just shown you four plus the old one. There are about tens of these, and each of these, we put them on each of the machines. All right, and each machine has a signature. Now, I'm sure you'll agree with me that the signature of the refrigerator is different from that of uh, a dryer or a dishwasher, right? So the signatures, the vibrations are different. So now what we are doing is that each of the Arduino board, which has multimodal sensors, is measuring data and it's creating a time series. And this is a, these are multiple time series, right? So t temperature time series, tau t, uh, pressure, uh, uh, pressure pi, humidity hi, vibration vi, uh, vi. And so we now have n time series and we are fusing all these time series at the Raspberry Pi, and we are learning some nice lessons. I'm going to say what lessons we are learning. The challenge is, what do you do when you fuse these time series? I'm going to leave that as an open question, because I can't share everything over here. What do you do with these multiple time series at the access point or at the Raspberry Pi? There's something you could do with analytics to answer some fundamental questions. Okay? So that's a very interesting question that we are attempting to answer as I talk. Yeah. Yeah, but the, that is true, but the question that we're trying to address is that each of your mechanical device has a signature, and therefore, if the end devices have n signatures, each device has multimodal sensors, so I have, and if they are, let's say, m sensors, I have m time series, you're fusing all m n time series on an, at an access point, and the question we're trying to answer is now, can you do some predictive dot, 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 dot? Can you predict something about failure or about malfunction and something? Probably, that's a great point, well, that's a great question. Probably not, because many of these devices are right, uh, are, are right next to each other. So we are, well, so you know, you kind of, <laughs> yeah, that is a great point. So probably not, because uh, one of the objective is to exploit spatio-temporal correlations. So we are deliberately trying to have similar devices together, and even when the devices are identical, the signatures are different. Time series is going to be significantly different, and so, the question that eventually at the second order it answers, what do you do with the spatio-temporal correlations? So that answers the question. So the devices are not that dissimilar. There's a lot of similarity also. Because we are, we are uh, there are many washers, there are many refrigerators. Okay, so, so hopefully this mimics a factory environment closer than just putting them in your lab, because the lab really doesn't do much, all right? All right, and again, we repeat the experiments with power consumption across these devices. Now, these are devices, by the way, these devices have, uh, now we have, we have more components. So we have more devices like NRF, so there's a new RF interface, Zigbee's, all kinds of protocols and uh, links. You can keep adding and measuring the power expended and repeat the experiments that we have, all right? And again, when you repeat the, uh, when you, for this spatio temporal distributed network, when you repeat the experiments, you do the same thing. You see the same observation that, Energy is evenly distributed, and it's significantly lower than if you were not to leverage a smart, uh, a, a smart set above you, which is a set of smart devices. All right, and the work goes on and on and on. So, what's the what's the summary? I'm not going to repeat this because this is really uh, 
uh, really kind of uh, being repetitive and in the interest of time I'm going to tell you what's the what's are some what are some of, some of the exciting research problems that are likely to keep many of us in this room busy so I'm going to skip that that's summary of my talk and you know what the talk is about but just one summary that you know if you don't have a POC if you don't have a proof of concept and if you only do simulations I will I don't think many of us will ever accept the paper at all you've got to have some proof of concept doesn't matter what the environment you got to mimic it if you can't visit a car manufacturing plant or if you can't visit a big plant mimic it and see how to mimic it along with your university partners or along with your colleagues in the industry right so that's uh, an important point to make so what's the future landscape uh, where are we going from now what's the future going to look like first thing is that the smart factories plants and assembly lines will heavily depend upon emerging technologies and novel services my friends the killer thing today that everyone is talking about is what are the killer services and my favorite example is two one is general motors onstar so if you if you subscribe to an onstar service in a car onstar knows everything about your car everything diagnostics prognostics everything and my other favorite example is the favorite insurance in the us progressive insurance so i don't know whether you know if you buy a dongle in the us you buy a usb called progressive from a company called progressive and put it inside your car's dashboard your insurance can dynamically change depending upon how you drive so if you drive well if you're a good boy and if you're a good girl let's not talk about what good means your insurance goes down and if you are a bad boy you visit many bars late at night in mg road right and let's not elaborate then your insurance goes up and if you drive you know if you take random turns if you don't if you're not a good driver your insurance goes up what an what an example of a killer service on top of a setup like a car and i suspect that in every mechanical setup in the times to come will have services which will play a big role and i think a lot of us whether it's microsoft or whether it's tcs or ibm or any other company are really looking at what are the killer services because technology at the lower layer has become it's become really a commodity you can't play much role in mac layer physical layer what do you do in the physical layer I was talking to my colleague here shivam what do you do in physical layer it's it's owned by cisco it's owned by juniper you can't do anything even cisco can't do anything they're looking at services at the higher layer so the summary is that in course of time in the years to come you will find that technically you, uh, in the technical landscape there'll be a lot of talk about big data analytics distributed analytics i was talking to our colleagues at microsoft um, about uh, distributed machine learning and big data analytics in iot devices all pervasive systems uh, leveraging cloud but i think in my view the two biggest areas that will keep us busy at least in our lifetime i don't know about the next uh, after 100 years but in the next 20 30 years if you can define algorithms which are going to provide cognition which means self healing networks self learning networks and improve and make your system more intelligent you're going to make big bucks and going to have your name and fame and cyber security oh i tell you this area is keeping us busy uh, awake all the nights and cyber security is a nightmare in the car i know you know that few, last year charlie miller broke the car uh, sitting one mile apart from his laptop charlie miller and chris valasek and they have become celebrities and they've joined the uber research labs in california now so so all kinds of things in cyber security are emerging in iot i have no clue about how security will look like in iot it's an open question i also know that if you work on cyber security in iot you can have 50 papers in the next few years the space is so wide open finally since we are all in industry many of us are in industry the business landscape we need to define some great use cases that benefit industry and that in turn will define new platforms and services and one of the endeavor that we are looking at is define new platform that we can sell to customers to our partners including universities look use the platform it gives you end to end cyber security or it gives you end to end uh, reliability so if you could do that then you really uh, you know are are it's it's you know it's really going to take you uh, great heights and finally you need to actually play with deployments of iot devices in an in an environment which is realistic doesn't matter what the environment if it's hospital then go to the hospital and deploy the iot devices retrofit them with in patients go to a manufacturing plant or go to a, a boeing plant or a gm plant if you can because if you don't iotize if you are not realistic about uh, deployment in other words if you don't go to an actual environment your models will be incorrect and nobody is going to accept uh, your, there'll be no value proposition right? so i'm going to end here uh, because there's so much to talk about this area industry 4.0 and iot is exploding 
and everyone, whether it's uh, the car manufacturers or now Tesla. So my favorite example is Tesla. Please have a look at Tesla uh, cars, the all electric cars. They're going to be game changers in the world now because I've been hearing that in the next few years, self-driving cars are going to be all over the world. So just wait for the next few years. And everything we talk about here in IoT will be in those cars. It'll be called M2M communications or machine to machine, but it'll be a variant of IoT. Okay, so I'm going to stop here. Thanks for your attention, but I'd love to take questions if you have any. Any questions for Rajiv? Yeah, one at the back. Rajiv is one. Yeah. Uh, at the back. What do you mean? How you mean? How often they form a cluster? You form a cluster organically, right? So it depends upon the algos, algos running over there. So you you def, you define a cluster organically. You grow the cluster depending upon how many nearby, how many, what kind of sensors. So you really got to define that, right? You got to define what the best means. So you got to put that down. No, no, no. So let me repeat. Nothing happens uh, automatically. You got to define it, right? So when you say best link, so suppose you have k links, you have to you have to define what is the best of the k. Oh, how often? Oh, that you can uh, you can fine tune that parameter. So for example, in our case, it's once every sixty seconds. Ah, I got it. So that's your software defined uh, paradigm. So you can define how often. In our case, I believe it's every sixty seconds we are discovering. Yeah, that is absolutely right. So there's a trade-off. So the, the more you discover, the more the more uh, uh, you know frequency with which you are trying to do things, the more your overheads absolutely, and therefore the more. And that's the question that you asked about the sleep uh, awake cycles, similar. So you've got to figure out what's the right uh, what's the right parameter, so that you don't miss something, number one, and and you don't you, it's not overkill for your system. You got to figure it out. And that's where we are also looking at software defined IoT because in my view it's such a complex world that if you don't have a software defined controller there you can do nothing with IoT. What will you do? You'll have 100 probes, you'll have 100 uh, measurements, 100 monitoring tools, it won't work. So there has to be some controller which talks to all the IoT clusters, not the million IoT devices but cluster wise. That's why the cluster is important over here and tells you the kind of question that you ask. Okay? So, Can you please repeat the question louder? Why do you not use static routing devices? When you mean, so give me an example of static routing devices. We just took what's available off the shelf. No, 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 no. So the question we asked was, let's pick and let's pick and choose whatever's available as accessible to everybody. So even a person who's a layman here can buy the Arduino board, can buy with modes, has smartphones, can do these experiments. So that was the whole idea. You could do that, sure, but it's a, it's a simplistic setting which is repeatable. No, we have, we have. It's not only, it's also, also Wi-Fi. I've just shown result for Bluetooth. We have. Because all the Arduino boards have multiple interfaces. You could tap Wi-Fi, just that we realize that with Wi-Fi, you got to just deplete the devices in no time. So the price that you're going to pay is going to be significantly higher. You'll just drain the battery uh, and it's always on because I'm not doing the intelligent sleep awake cycles, right? Right? So that's the reason. Absolutely. If you attack the smart device, No, ma'am, we're not looking at security at all in this experiment. That's a whole new world. No. If I talk about security, I'll probably need another four or five hours to just talk about how we are handling IoT security. No, 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 no. That's a totally different uh, world altogether. In fact, in my view, security at the IoT layer is killer. Security, I won't worry much about security of the, of mobile, of the smart devices because by definition, they have much tighter policies and controls than the IoT devices. I mean, look at IoT devices. They're completely open, right? Everything is open. It's open source, open source software. You can buy them off the shelf. We've done some work. Another, another you probably can also uh, you know, remember the whole discussion of IoT. 
security at that layer is a nightmare. I don't even know what the perimeter is. Forget about the security. Okay. So I won't worry about security at the higher layers. I will worry about the lower layers. Not that it's, it is there, but I relative, relatively uh, lower layers are critical. Yeah. We we'll take one last question. No, I, no problem. Uh, well, that's a great question. So, so the question is, if IoT devices are used only for sensing, so here's the answer. No, they're not only used for sensing, because many are. They're not. I, sensing is the most dumb operation. See, with sensing, with all kinds of sensing sensors at each IoT device, I have data, and that data could be critical. So, if I have a, if a, not me. I mean, that's a wrong example. If a patient has a pacemaker, and I'm generating data about the about the heart systolic diastolic beats i want to make sure that data doesn't go to anyone except the doctor or the personal physician and and the list of uh, and so this is one example the the healthcare <laughs> the personal the body area networks data privacy is critical so you don't want you want to be very careful uh, if the data especially if you are in a us territory and the data is leaked you could be in deep deep trouble because the regulatory aspects are very stringent over there right so it's not only sensing, it's data, you've got to protect the data. And how you do that is anybody's question. Efficient. Okay. Uh, well, the last question. Make it very quick. Yeah, absolutely. Great, great point. Yeah, that's many of us doing. I remember, you know, I know that Microsoft was working on that. Absolutely, we do examine trade-offs. So you don't want to send everything to the back end because there's a there's a latency issue there. You don't want to do that. So you really figure out what data will you will you offload to the higher layers and what you will keep at the lower layers. So let's say you keep X data here and one minus X to the higher layers. You could figure out what that X is. Absolutely. So the more you the the more data that goes to the fog or the cloud, the more the SLA uh, issues. So you've got to figure that out. So that's a trade-off, which is an open question. And there's no clear answer because it depends upon the application, depends upon the use case, depends upon the type of sensors. Yeah? We'll talk offline. Okay, let's thank Rajiv for the uh, interesting talk. And, uh,